The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Oh, what a great audience. Let's dim the lights for this next one. Nope, too much. Ah, there it is. Got to get things just right. Like Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay and we help you find coverage options that fit your budget. And now, the mood is right. Wait, the lights are back on again. Trudy, can you? And now it's completely dark. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0, the only podcast that focuses on mental health while mixing in movies, music, books, sports, and pop culture. Here are your hosts, Rebecca and Joe Lombardo. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. This is Scott, the producer. It looks like we're having trouble with Rebecca and Joe's mic again. We do have our special guest, Madeline Black, on the line. We are going to go to a quick song and have Joe and Rebecca call back in. And we'll be going in just a couple of seconds here. Um, Actually, I'll give them one second to call in. But welcome to Voices for Change 2.0. Give me one second, and we'll see if we can get Joe and Rebecca back on the line here. Uh, every once in a while, their their microphone goes out for some reason. I think it's a blog talk radio thing. But we have a great guest today with Madeline Black calling it all the way from Glasgow. And uh, let's see if we have Joe and Rebecca back on the line. Joe, Rebecca, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yay, yep, we can hear you. We're back. Yay. <laughs> all right, well, we're not going to go to song, guys. Welcome, Joe and Rebecca. Here we go, guys. You're live on the air. Right. Hooray. Thank you so thanks, much, guys. Thanks, Scott. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, we're not quite sure what it is about our setup that that does that. That's that was the second or third time that's happened to yeah, us. Yeah, at least. So we we apologize for the technical glitches. Um, I I don't have a good excuse, so <laughs> I'm not going to make excuse, one. So. Yeah. So um, anyway, thanks very much for for being with us this morning. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to listen to our humble little show on this wonderful. Saturday in April 2018. Cold. Cold, sunny <laughs> but cold here in Detroit anyway. Um, babe? So today we have uh, an inspirational guest on the show with us. Uh, she has shown all of us what a survivor truly is. And she's a best-selling author, speaker, and an advocate. So we're really excited to welcome Madeline Black to the show. Hi there. Hello. <laughs> good. Well, good morning for for us. Good afternoon for you. Yes, afternoon Call, for me. <laughs> yep, calling calling us all the way from from beautiful Scotland. Uh, yep. It's very exciting for us and <laughs> some place that we would someday love to visit. That's for sure. Yeah. So, how's it going? It's going good, thank you. It's a, it's a wet and cold day here, but apart from that, it's all going good. <laughs> Do you have any questions for us before we jump right in? No, I'm just very happy to go with the flow. Okay, sounds Yay. good. Well, we're, we're happy that you took time out of your day to be with us today, Madeline, and uh, we're, we're honored. So, so thank you very, very much. You're very welcome. All right, so we're just going to get started. Yeah. Uh, very early on in your life, you had to survive a horrific trauma. For those that don't know your story, would you please tell us about it? Sure. When my story starts in the late 1970s, and I was gang raped by two young American teenagers when I was just 13 years old. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. It's it's absolutely horrible. Uh, We're so sorry uh, about that, uh, just in a lot of ways. Um, What... How how did that impact your uh, God? How, how do I want to put it? Um, like going forward, how how did you begin to pick up the pieces after that? 
when I didn't really go forward for a long time, it affected me in so many ways. And to start with, I couldn't speak about it. But, you know, what we don't speak about, it it leaks out of us. And it, it leaked out of me in, in many ways. And that when I look back now, I realize I was just trying to numb out. So, you know, I became... Um, I used drugs, I used alcohol, I became very promiscuous, I attempted suicide, I had an eating disorder, I spent a few months in a children's psychiatric ward, my opinion of myself was so low, I had fears, phobias, I hated myself, I was scared of the world I lived in, so yeah, it had a huge impact on my life. Yeah. Wow, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was actually my next question, was um, did that incident cause you to to seek mental health care. Did you do you still seek mental health care today? Uh, I'm I'm really really in a good place today, but the mental health care I received was when I attempted suicide, so I was nearly 14, but that I didn't you know seek that help. It was put upon me obviously because of the situation and I wasn't a very willing patient. I was then at a stage where I couldn't or wouldn't speak about what had happened. And I think to be honest, my mind had actually shut it off so much that I didn't actually remember what had happened. It took me many, many years to really get all my memories back. It took a long time. Wow. Um how how what is your family? Was... Yeah, did you have support from your family? Yeah. Well, I didn't tell my parents for about three years, and even then I couldn't actually tell them. So what I did was that I wrote a note and I left it on my pillow when I was about 16, so about three years later. And I went to school, and they came back, and they asked me about this. But there was another girl involved, and she said that they were nice boys, and they wouldn't behave like that. They were sons of diplomats living in London for a couple of years. So it had taken me all these years to find my voice. But in that moment, I just felt betrayed, and I felt like they didn't believe me, which wasn't the case. But in my screwed-up 16-year-old head, that's what I thought, that I wasn't believed. So that just sent me deeper into a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. Yeah. I, I am I am so sorry that you went through such such a terrible experience, you know. Uh, well, sadly, I know since I've shared my story, and as we've seen with the Me Too movement, my story is just the story of so many people. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It, it really is. Um, yeah. <coughs> excuse me. Um, what do you do to get through? Uh, the hard times, you know, if, if if things get difficult. Well, one of the things I think that really helped me was I reversed my thinking, and I don't really know where it came in from, but when I first met my husband, I went away to Israel for a year. My parents thought it would be a good idea to get away from all the bad influences that I was under, people that were taking drugs and whatever, and I met my husband, Stephen, about 35 years ago, and I always told him when I first met him that I wouldn't have children, and he was fine, but every now and again he would ask me the question again, and I remember the exact moment that we were away on a beach in Thailand and he asked me the question again. And I was all ready for my usual answer of, you know, I can't do that. But something came in and made me change my mind. And I thought, you know, if I never become a mum, I now have three daughters, then these two young men would have won. They would have, they'd still be having power and control over my life. And I didn't want them to do that. So it was then that I came up with my plan that I call my best revenge which would just be to live my life as well as I could, and I just refused to be identified from that point to, by what had happened to me. And I thought that was it. I thought I had healed. <laughs> but it's, trauma right. has a way of coming back <laughs> later on. When we think we're done, it kind of you know, comes back up again to greet us. <laughs> yeah, it has a tendency of rearing its ugly head when you least it expect does. it. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, but the that... symptoms of PTSD are debilitating. So, you know you're always probably going to have a little bit of that in, in your life, I would think. I would say, actually, to be honest, I really don't have any PTSD anymore. I worked so hard. I mean, where I'm at right now, and it sounds, you know, maybe difficult for people that are going right through it right now, but it's been a process. You know, it's taken me many, many years and many different types of therapies. But really now I went out of my way to challenge all my fears and my phobias once I saw them. And I really would say that I'm really, really okay. Well, that's good. That's, that's good to hear. Yeah, that is yeah. really good to hear. Um, there's something I wanted to ask. Sorry, Ben. No, that's all right. No, no, you're you're fine. Um, the it sounds like it was a just a transformational thought for you when you decided you changed your mind and 
have uh, children. Um, Mm -hmm. Once you did that, did that start having a a snowball effect on how you viewed the rest of the world around you? Um, Did Yes and no. I I could see that if I wasn't careful that I would then project all my fear onto my children. And then I thought, what would be the point of having children and then making them filled with fear? So then I really had to work my fear. I saw that most of my fears were around men and my safety. I was paranoid about my safety. You know, I I couldn't even take my rubbish bin down to the end of the garden if it was dark or I'd get in my car and I'd put the locks down I wouldn't take a taxi anywhere every single thing that I did I had to you know think about it in my head had to plan how to get somewhere so I started to challenge my fears and I realized that my fears they weren't really real everything was based on what had happened to me and it was based on what could happen to me so none of it was going on right now it was just my imagination but again like I said before that's taken me a lot (laughs) to work that out a lot of processing and different therapies to get to where I'm at wow is there any one particular uh therapy or method method that was especially beneficial for you well there's been quite a few actually and one of the main ones has been to find my voice to say it in its entirety what had happened and obviously I've written my book now so I've put it all down in print but to be listened to and to be heard and to be believed I don't think there's anything more powerful than that and it was when I was having therapy my therapist also suggested going for body therapy like therapeutic massage and the very first time I went I could hear this person shouting and screaming and crying and I thought oh my gosh then I realized it was coming from me (laughs) so you know all our trauma gets caught in our body in our cells and I think we really need to find whatever way it works for you we need to find a way to shift it and it might not just be only with words it might not just be talking therapies you know there's many different types of therapies out there you know, wow. and what you're saying about, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> finding your voice, um, you know, I, I had sort of, rape is, is a very, is a very powerful word, I guess you could say. And even when I was writing the, the questions for this show, I had trouble because I didn't want to mm-hmm. say the word, you yeah. know, and I, I, I couldn't say it for years. The, I can say it now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you you mentioned your book. Um, your yeah. book is called Un- Unbroken. Uh, would you please? Year old now. <laughs> <laughs> would you please share share uh, uh, share your book with us? Tell tell us about it. Sure. Um, well, it really follows my journey of from that night, and I was actually raped three more times before I was eighteen, and it follows my journey of survival, healing, forgiveness, transformation, and hope. And I wrote it with the intention that it would give other people a voice because, you know, I know it was the courage of someone else speaking out that helped me to find my voice and I really want to pay that forward. And I was very particular about putting all the details into my book because there was a lot of arguments about it before. I wasn't really into writing everything down. And then I saw that if I didn't write everything down, then I would be sanitizing it and I would be making it prettier so that people wouldn't be uncomfortable. Like, you know, we even struggled to say the word rape. And I thought, well, if I don't Mm -hmm. write it all down, then I'm just covering it up. I'm making it, I'm sanitizing it. And I wanted it to be there for exactly how it was. (coughs) Sorry. Sorry about that. I had to cough. (laughs) Um, yeah, so I you know, know it is the, the tough to th- read in parts, but it, it does end well. <laughs> yeah, that's that's okay. that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and that's the one thing that you always hear about is when a person goes through something like this. You know, you have to speak out, and you have to keep speaking out until you're heard. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I I I think it's wonderful that you finally you know that, that you that you did this that you. You know, you didn't just collapse. Right. You know, you, yeah. you well, I did for a while, <laughs> but afterwards, well, yeah. uh, I fought back. Sure. <laughs> you have to collapse because right. I mean, the trauma is just biology; it takes over. Right, right. But I mean, eventually, you you came out of that, and yeah. you were, you know, you said your truth until you finally had that one person look at you and say, "I believe you." You know, and yeah. that's got to just be 
you know, a weight off your shoulders once you're actually told that. You yeah, know. you know, it was really when my oldest daughter turned 13 that all the memories came back and all the flashbacks and the nightmares and the feelings and the thoughts and my PTSD then was really heightened and I thought, well, if it was so bad, surely I would remember it. But now I know it's because it was so bad. That's why I couldn't remember it because now I, I work as a psychotherapist. But it was, you know, the memories, I went back to counseling to try to take them away and I realized I couldn't take them away and I went back for about three years and I'd already had counsel, counseling beforehand and I really, it wasn't so much the memories that were disturbing me, it was what I was doing with them. I just didn't want to believe it. I couldn't believe that had happened and I refused to believe it. But the more I denied it, the more the memories would come in. So I really had to find a way to accept all that had done to me and you know I had to realize well I am still alive you know they tried to but they didn't kill me I am still here I've led my life as well as I could I do believe that life is for living and I thought you know actually I'm not my body I'm not the things that are done to me and and the true essence of me whatever you want to call it they could never harm that that always remains untouched mm. yeah. agreed mm. you know and that's and that's a powerful uh conclusion to come to yeah. in life you know is you know they can they can do all this stuff to me but i'm still going to overcome it mm -hmm. you know i'm still yeah. going to thrive and that's the the biggest um hurdle yeah you know and 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 you know it's a big it, it's a big f you to hear mm -hmm. attackers that you know you tried to put me through this and i have overcome what you've done to me you know and yeah you know, I think, you know, getting getting back to your book, you know, you, you state that, you know, you didn't want to sanitize it, that you wanted to put, you know, your truth out there. And mm -hmm. that, I it's it's real and it's raw and it's honest, um, you know, doing that. You know, Beck did the same thing with hers, you know, and, and you find that when you can be completely honest about what you've been through and you don't sanitize it, you know, the amount of people that will come forward and say, I went through the same thing. Absolutely. You know, and you... Uh, every day I get messages from survivors that have been on my website or read my book or Facebook page. Every day somebody will share their story with me since I've gone public. Yeah. So I know and, and that's, so many people out there. Yeah, it's powerful. You know, when when yeah. you've got that that type of thing, you know, you're making that kind of impact on people's lives. You know, that is a powerful statement, you know, and, and it helps people, <coughs> excuse me, it helps people realize that, you know, there's more of us than there are of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. Well, Marina, yeah, who is so the founder of the Forgiveness Project, which is where I first shared my story, she often refers to us as story healers rather than story teller, uh, tellers, and she believes in the sharing of our narratives, our stories, and what it can do for other people, and that's really now why I share my story. It's not what it can do for me anymore, it's what it can do for other people. I really like that. Yeah. Story healers. Yeah. That's that's a nice yeah. term, you know. And, it's and lovely, I think isn't it's very <laughs> true. It is. It really yeah. is. Um, you know, that's that's a, a powerful thing, you know, knowing you know, and having the courage too to, to come forward and tell your story in the hopes that, you know, it's not only going to heal you but it's going to heal mm -hmm. others as well. Yeah. You know, that's I think the essence of you know, part of why we're here is, mm -hmm. you know, to show people that, you know, you're here for me, I'm here for you. You know, we're all in this together. And that's the one thing yep. that really kills me in in society today in, in general is there's so much, you know, us versus them, me versus you. And, you know, really it's, you know, we just, we, we, we have to, realize that we need to all come together yeah. you know and we have to realize actually we've got more in common than we have in what divides us <laughs> exactly exactly mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> you know just for um those of those of our, our listeners can you tell us where they can pick your book up 
sure. Well, you, you can get it online on Amazon. In the UK, you can get it in bookstores. I think hopefully you can get it in America in bookstores as well. But, uh, yeah, or via my website. You can contact me if you want a signed copy. I'm very happy to send it out via PayPal. So lots <laughs> of places. <laughs> Okay. That's good. Perfect. Yeah. Um, Madeline, what do you think the biggest misconceptions are about sexual assault? Well, there's so many. <laughs> so many. We live in such a society of rape culture. There's so much victim blaming going on. You know, even then in the late 1970s, as a 13-year-old, I was worried it was my fault. I felt guilty. I had been drinking. I lied about where I was staying. You know, I thought I would get into trouble because of the messages then, even as a young teenager, that were fed to me. And if we look at the way women are objectified, the music, the programs. I mean, we don't really want to speak about your president, but, you know, how seriously do yeah. America really take sexual assault if somebody can grab him by the pussy just because he's famous? You know, look at the society we live in. And then we've had so many cases here where it seems that the men are guilty. And then the, you wonder who's on trial in the court. Our court systems are so bad. I, I live in Scotland. And out of the cases that make it to court, it's only something like 4 or 5% will end in conviction. So you wonder why wow. women or men would bother reporting if that's going to be the outcome because it's a really horrible ordeal to be a witness in a rape trial if you know you, you are up against the accused. So so many changes yeah. need to happen. Yeah, it's, it's bad over here too. And, yeah. you know, by all means, I, I I don't blame you for for bringing up our uh, embarrassment of a president. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, it's a touchy subject for me. I, I I could spend an hour just railing against yeah, that we're guy. Not gonna let him. Yeah, yeah, she won't <laughs> let me. So good. Um, but, <laughs> but but you, yeah, but you do wonder how seriously do they take it if that's that's who you have you know voted that, in. That's the problem, and and there's yeah. It's it's a whole topic of conversation trying yeah. to make sense of how he got in the first place and you know versus what you know our previous president and uh, mm -hmm. that's just that's just a whole other conversation entirely. But yeah. I agree that things definitely need to need to change. I mean, you know, over here, I don't know if if you guys have this in in Scotland, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like. Like in Detroit alone, there are, you know, th hundreds or thousands of unprocessed rape kits that go back a couple decades, you know, and that yeah. just speaks to how slow the courts are on this, how slow everything gets handled, and it needs yes, to change. Yes, absolutely. I think, the, I think the cases should be fast-tracked. I mean, here you could wait two or three years, and somebody told me in India somebody's waiting 10 years for a court trial, and you think they could fast-track it. They could see they could do it in three, four months, easy. Mm. And I, I don't know whether juries should be present. We have a, the jury system, or whether they need to be trained or the judges need to be trained, because, you know, women are told, well, make sure you cry, make sure you wear this. So they're always looking for the perfect victim, you know, how you appear. Mm. And there's no perfect victim. Anyone can be a victim of rape or sexual assault. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you know, and um, there's a whole other way I was going to go with this, but uh, do that on the other side. we're going to do that on the other side because uh, okay. it's time for our first break. So um, we're going to take a few minutes here. Uh, this is going to be It Gets Better from uh, Blake McIver, and uh, we will see you on the other side.
lied and told you that you're weak and they are strong. They put that loaded metal in your head. But I can help you understand. Yeah. I know you're hurting. I can feel your pain. But you've got a future. Welcome back to Voice for Change 2.0. We're so glad to have you with us today. Yes, indeed. And if you're just joining us, we are talking to uh, Miss Madeleine Black <laughs> from Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. You should never try and do it. You're an welcome. Accent when I'm talking to somebody with an accent. I was trying not to. <laughs> I, I promise you, I, I really wasn't because my. my Scottish accent is not anywhere near what it used to be. And I'm actually English and anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> I had a feeling. I had it because it's not that, you know, uh, I'm not going to do the Michael You can Myers understand thing. me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say it. But, uh, yeah, so, so that's well, that's cool. So, Well, jumping right back into our moving, questions. Moving right along. Um, stop. <laughs> so what would you say to anyone that might be struggling after an assault currently? I would say whenever it happened, you know, whether it's recent or whether it's decades ago, because some people will never find their voice, that it's never too late to go and get help, to um, to speak to someone, to share your story, to be heard, to be listened to. It takes such a huge step. For me, it was the shame. I put myself in a prison of silence for years, and it took me 35 years to share my story publicly. I can't explain what shame does. It's just such a destructive emotion. You know, I just used to believe that people, if they found out that somehow it was a reflection of me, that they would be, they would feel about me how I felt about myself, and that was that I was worthless, that I was dirty, that I was contaminated, and I did everything to avoid people finding out. So it's kind of ironic that now I speak about it all the time. But, yeah, the shame is so hard to work through. But I realize now that I never had anything to be ashamed about. The shame never belonged to me. I carried inappropriate shame for years, you know. It wasn't something I invited in. It was something that was done to me at at a young age. And I would say the shame doesn't belong to you. The shame always belongs to the perpetrators. And the silence only hurts us. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. that uh that is solid that's yeah you know and that's the thing is it's not you know you it wasn't your fault you know it wasn't Mm -hmm. anything that you you know said or did or anything it was the actions of these other people impacting Mm -hmm. your life you know and it's it's tragic when 
you know, people have to carry this this shame with them wherever they go, you know. Yeah. Um you know, it's awesome that you that you're able to, to work through that and uh speak out Definitely. now, you know. Um and that you found well, I kind your of voice. call myself a, an accidental activist or an accidental speaker. It wasn't ever really in my plan. Um but it was since I shared my story nearly 4 years ago, I was just invited to speak and I realized actually Somehow, I don't know why, I don't get nervous, and I really am okay about speaking. And I think even if it just helps one person in the audience, then that's fine. Then that's that's my job done. So I will just, if people invite me, I will just speak, because you never know who's listening or where the ripples go to. Exactly, exactly. I, gotta, I, I personally have to wonder what kind of impact your speaking out might have had on uh, this is a, kind of a delicate question I, I guess but mm-hmm. what kind of impact it would have on your attackers I don't you know? know I don't have anything to do with them I don't know where they are <laughs> so I have no idea no idea no, I just it, it kind of makes me wonder you know how you know do, do they now this is all speculative you know it, it's mm-hmm. all what if stuff and yeah and i don't fill my head with that anymore because i can't worry about them that's not my journey now but you know something happened to me when i was having therapy which i never ever intended to do my therapist suggested to me that maybe these two young men weren't born rapists and at first you know i was completely outraged i thought how dare he say that to me i was so angry i was so bitter and sarcastic i was horrible most of the time uh, but then you know he planted this seed in my head and it i really started to think the seed started to grow i wanted to wonder understand how did they know how to behave so violently towards another human being and i thought about what had they seen or heard or experienced and i really started to take that into my heart and i did start to feel forgiveness or i felt compassion towards them because I thought, I have to live with what's done to me. They're going to have to live with what they did to another human being. And I saw that when they were dehumanizing me, are they not really dehumanizing themselves? You know, when they, they were not connected in, and I do believe we all come into the world the same way, and they had been conditioned by life, whatever had happened to them. I'm not, I'm never could never forgive the act of rape that's not what i'm saying but i learned to find right. a, a place or a way to forgive them and to to really accept it and to let it go and then actually once i did that it was much easier there was no more hate or anger or revenge in my heart because i would fantasize about somebody kidnapping them and taking them to an empty flat tying them up and beating them up and raping them for four or five hours just like they had done to me but i thought well, they would have no idea that I'm full of hate who is it going to hurt it's only going to hurt me and I really had to find a way to just let it go because it was destructive it's such a horrible emotion hate to hold on to it just it it touches everything in your life plus you have to find a way to forgive yourself even though you're not at fault oh yeah it was still forgiveness for myself that I started with Mm -hmm. absolutely Rebecca you know and and I felt so guilty for years and I realized you know as I said I didn't have anything to be guilty about and forgiveness for me is is about self-love as well, and it's about understanding that we, you know, we're all born babies. I've never once met an evil baby. We're all born the same way <laughs> that we come into the world, and we get conditioned by our experiences. Yeah, that's, that's mm-hmm. exactly right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, uh, I I had a really really good thing I was going to say. <laughs> well, I'm telling Sorry, you, I, this, I answer very long questions. <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 you know. You say something and it gets me, gets me, gets a spark going, and then it's like, Good. oh, but you're you're older now and you don't remember things that you thought a minute ago, and that and that's <laughs> I have the senior moments as well. It's okay. <laughs> oh my God, is this you know people make cracks about senior moments, but I'm telling you what, this is a real thing, people. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but I no, just I, I guess the the one thing where I was going with what I was saying earlier about your attackers is I'm I'm kind of hoping that by you speaking out and and others speaking out that maybe it gives the attackers I don't know if it, I don't want to say it gives them pause but it makes them kind of stop and realize oh my God what have I done 
you know, yeah, well, and maybe... Even, it, even not in my situation, maybe with the Me Too movement, maybe some men will now question their actions, or maybe was that rape? Did I get consent? It's really good that we've raised the consciousness and men will start to think about their actions, or, or if they're in a work situation and the woman you know, is being ridiculed and being joked at or being sexually harassed, maybe now they will step in and it won't be acceptable anymore. So it's great that the awareness, the consciousness has been raised. Yeah, we were going to actually ask you about uh, how you felt about the Me Too movement. Well, you know, it's interesting. Most men I speak to are so surprised, and most women I speak to are not surprised at all. <laughs> we we know the fear of walking down the street, looking over our shoulder, looking at a man. Is he? Isn't he going to attack me? Am I safe? Am I not? You know, it's something we feel all the time. Uh, we always suss out situations. Is this okay? Is this not? But men seem to have been surprised by ha- the outpouring. But I think it is fantastic that it's given so many women. Uh, a voice, you know, I think within the first hour on Twitter, the hashtag Me Too, it was millions of women who retweeted it in the first hour, something like 24 million. It was outrageous, huge, big number. And you think, well, how many are still quiet? How many still haven't found their voice? How many yeah. still can't speak about what happened? So it's great, you know, because it, it was the courage of somebody else speaking out that helped me find my voice. I was talking to a woman online who's also a story with the Forgiveness Project, and she was going to prison as part of a restorative justice meeting to meet the serial rapist who had raped her, which I just thought she was a warrior. I thought it was amazing. And Marina asked to share my story, and she said, you know, you don't need to put your picture, you don't need to put your name. And I just thought, well, if she can do that, then I've got nothing to be ashamed about anymore. I'm fed up of hiding and pretending, you know, you know, I didn't want to hide anymore. So... To find my voice has been the single most powerful thing, and I think the hashtag Me Too is helping other women and men to find their voice too. I agree, you know, and, and I have to say, as a as a man, um, I'm not so much surprised by the outpouring or mm-hmm. anything. I'm I'm more I I, I think yeah. I'm I'm not I guess how do I want to say it? Um I'm not shocked. You know. Yeah, I'm good. just I'm I'm you know, unfortunately I, I hate to say that, but I'm you know, I'm I'm kinda of surprised it didn't happen sooner. You know, all these people speaking out, um and coming forward and saying that uh you know, that, that they that it happened to them as well. You know, yeah. um, it breaks it breaks my heart. You know, mm-hmm. I guess the, you know, I don't want to even say that the the number, like you mentioned, it was like twenty four million or something that had, mm-hmm. you know, retweeted the hashtag. Yeah, it must be millions now. I don't even know how many. Yeah, now. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and it's like it's it's sad how how prevalent and and yep. uh, far reaching it is. You know, and and you know, the thing that that makes a, a man stop and think is, well, you know, this is somebody's mother, this is somebody's sister, somebody's Absolutely. daughter. Absolutely. You know, um and you know, I can I I guess the one difficult thing for, for men is you know, I, I think going forward the the men might be a little more gun shy when it comes to you know, saying or or you know, approaching a woman. You know That's fine. <laughs> You know, uh, you know that that I don't have any problem with that at all. I mean, I think they they ought to be more respectful when, well, I, when and I, women. And I agree. You know, I, I agree. You know, they're, they're and that's maybe that's the biggest takeaway from this is, you know, there can start being some some healing and respect in mm-hmm. the whole thing. You know, versus. Yeah. I I think if you're a decent, normal guy, you've got nothing to worry about. It's the men that I hear that are saying that Me Too is just an excuse for women to start blaming things when they didn't want sex or whatever. No, that's not right. It's about giving people a voice and letting them share their stories. If you've got nothing to worry about, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and, you know, on, on us as men, you know, it behooves us to really, truly understand and take to heart that no means no, you know, Absolutely. and, you know, sorry, guys, you're, you're not God's gift to women. You know, yeah. if you approach somebody and they say, no, let it go. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you, yeah, you so hopefully all... out of all of this, 
we, we will learn about respect, we'll learn about consent, about healthy relationships. And maybe for my children or their children, this will be a thing of the past. You know, it would be so normal to say, well, did you get consent? You know, did she say mm-hmm. yes or did he say yes? Um, yeah, yeah I, I saw a report about Iceland, actually. Now they've stopped asking the woman, um, you know, what what did you do? They're asking the men, well, did she say yes? And I think, well, that is how it starts. Because so much of it mm-hmm. is put on... You know, what were you wearing? What were you drinking? What were you doing out late? It's, or they put all the blame on women, or they say to women, well, don't go out, it's late, it's dark, and, and we have to keep ourselves safe. Well, no, surely we need to teach people how not to rape. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's the thing is, you know, yeah. in this day and age, you know, not, I mean, this is kind of the nth degree, but a woman walking down the street naked shouldn't have mm-hmm. to worry about somebody assaulting her. You know, yeah. um, the, the, it shouldn't be the issue that it is. You know, it shouldn't have to be, uh, you know, women being afraid to go out at night to, you know, even something as simple as putting your trash out. You know, yep. um, like like you were saying, you know, how how afraid you were. Um, yeah, that shouldn't be an issue. That shouldn't and. Um, it, it's on us. It's on us as men to change our way of thinking, you know. And, Absolutely. And it's on all of us. It's not just a woman's issue or a man's issue. It's a, a human race issue. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, what do you think needs to be done going forward to combat uh, stigma? Oh, we need to challenge it wherever we see it. We need to just let people know it's not appropriate. That, And I, I really hope now with Me Too that it's great that it's been used on social media, you know, and it's really raised awareness, but somehow we need to find a way to take it off social media and put something into action. Quite what that is, I don't know yet. <laughs> but we need to find a way to keep the keep it going. Not just It's not just about social media. It's got to be implemented into businesses, into society, into schools, into colleges, everywhere, to have a, a no, you know, just a zero tolerance policy. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the social media thing is a good start. I think it's mm-hmm. it's helping to raise awareness. Um, <clears throat> I think now maybe we need to start looking at policy. Yeah. yeah. That's the battle that we're fighting with, with mental yeah. illness as well, you know. Absolutely. I mean, it started in Hollywood with all the 50-plus women coming forward about Harvey Weinstein, but obviously then it escalated that actually it's in all professions. It's not just, you know, Mm -hmm. exclusive to Hollywood. Most women I know have been spoken to inappropriately, been leered at, been groped, been flashed at, you know. I really don't know any woman that hasn't. And then I know women that have been raped and abused as well. So that's from the whole spectrum of inappropriate behavior I don't think I know any woman that that hasn't been affected in some way. Mhm. Yeah. 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 I had issues in my life going all the way back to high school. So, yeah. you know, when you're talking about making yourself feel secure or safe, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's a constant struggle. We just went to the movies the other night and it was a later movie and we were walking mm-hmm. out and we were just about the only people in the theater and in the parking lot. And at two different times, there was one man walking behind us. Mm-hmm. And the entire time, I'm just willing my feet to keep going because I'm terrified what this guy is going to do. Mm-hmm. And he eventually turned off and went to his own car, which wasn't anywhere near ours. But mm-hmm. I had to use the restroom, but I said, forget it, we'll just go home. Because I didn't want to stop and give this guy an excuse to do something if he was going to. Yeah, and and mm-hmm. and she she's saying this, and she felt this way with me being right next to her, mm-hmm. knowing that I would give my life to protect her. But you know, it's still just just the fact that my wife, after all these years, still has these kind of fears. You know, yeah. it it really, as a man, it kind of opens up my eyes to see how insidious this whole. Uh, culture it's has hard really because become it's, it's a lot of it stems from our own personal experiences, but a lot of it stems from the messages that we give society. You know, you're not safe if there's somebody from you. And the guy could just be going to his car, but it's what we do mm-hmm. with something, isn't it? It's what we then do with it in our mind and how we can 
grow it out of proportion or how we can calm ourselves down. It's always about, I always think it's not what happens to us that is important, it's what we do with it. Yeah, you know, perception is reality, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So. Well, we are going to go and take our last break. Uh, We'll see you on the other side of this song, which is Beautiful by David Hernandez. Father in the sky and they're starting to align. I see you passing by and we're slowing down the sky. Now my love is flashing by. All I see is flashing lights. Cause you're right here by my side. Can you feel it come alive? If this were a love song, would you be mine? I just can't get you off of my mind. And I think about you. Welcome back to Voices for Change 2.0. I am Joe. This is Rebecca sitting next to me. Hello. Hello. And on the line, we have Miss Madeline Black. Hello, Hi. lovely lady. How are you? I'm doing good, thank you. That's good. Uh, but that song is a peppy tune, isn't it? Yeah, it's a peppy song. <laughs> um, Peppier than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what have you learned about yourself having survived uh, such horrible experience? Well, I have really learned that I am so much stronger than I thought I ever was. In fact, we all are stronger than we think we are. And I'm very lucky that I had a good teacher in both of my parents. But my dad especially, um, he was a Holocaust survivor who's both his Mm. parents, his brothers and sisters, his youngest brother, Mordechai, was only six. They were all gassed in Auschwitz. So he was a widow when my mum met him. And it wasn't so much by what he said but it was by how he lived his life that he showed me that 
life was for living and he really enjoyed his life and I used to think well if my dad can get past all of that surely I can get past one night you know there must be a way Mm -hmm. and my mum as well she had a neck and back injury and was bedridden for a couple of years and then she went on to heal herself and both of them have amazing resilience and they thrived so yeah I think we all are so much stronger than we think we are when it really comes down to it wow that's powerful Mm mm-hmm very you much know. so. Yeah. Um, would you take a minute and tell us about your TED Talk? I haven't done a TED Talk, but that's very nice of you to imagine that I have. <laughs> I have a video that oh, people cool. can see. Yeah. Um, there's a video that was made actually by a woman, a filmmaker that I know, Kathleen Little, and it's called Stronger, so it kind of fits in there. And it's just it's actually on my website, which you can view. It's on uh, madeleineblack.co.uk, and it's about 16 minutes long, so it's like a TED Talk kind of length, and it's just really about my story. Um, hmm. So, yeah, I just really I share, share my story with me. it. <laughs> yeah, that's on me. I could have sworn, I, I know you've been uh, posting a lot of, uh, pictures lately of different shows that you've been on and everything, yeah. and um, I know that I just saw like the beginning of a clip, and I I assumed it was a TED talk, so that's my call. Yeah. My bad. No, that's okay. <laughs> and there was a few. There was a, uh, an event recently when I was given an award, and actually I won the category of strength. So something about strength seems to be a kind of a theme for me. <laughs> and they did they did yeah. a little video that went with the events. So it might have been that one you saw. Yeah, well, you you definitely have strength and spades. I'll tell you that much. Mm-hmm, for sure. Wow. Um, if Madeline, if if people want to reach out to you on social media, uh, how can they find you? Sure, I'm I'm all over the place. So there is my website, madeleineblack.co.uk, or on Twitter, I'm madblack65. The same on Instagram, or I have a, a public Facebook page as well, which is Madeline Black Unbroken. Or on LinkedIn, so I'm I am all over the place. Oh, you are all over the place. And I do always reply to messages. Yeah, um, I do. It might take a while, but I always reply to messages. So please do send me a message if you want to. That's awesome. Yeah, could, would you mind spelling your first name so folks know uh, sure. how to find you? It's like the French way, so it's M A D E L E I N E. Okay, perfect. Very cool. Madeleine Black. Very, very Black cool. is in the color. Yes. <laughs> well, that was the easy part. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, yeah we, we had that one. We had that figured. <laughs> so, what is next for you going forward? You know, I don't really know. All of what's happened to me, I've never really planned. I just really kind of learned to just trust life. And when I do one event, there's often somebody there that says, "Could you come here? Could you go there?" So. When I've spoken in schools or book festivals or conferences, I've never really planned to, which is why I kind of call myself this accidental activist or accidental speaker. It just kind of comes in. So I'm just very happy just to wait and see where the next thing is that comes in to me. And what, cool. what, if you had to pick something that, that you would want to do, something new, mm-hmm. what would that be? Well, I wouldn't be something new, but I have spoken in a few schools, and I really do like speaking with young people. They are so receptive, despite the teachers' fears that what I would tell them could traumatize them, But and they're just great. And I think if we can start educating even at a younger age, not necessarily to hear my story, but to talk about consent and relationships and healthy attitudes, it's going to make such a difference to people coming into this world. Yeah, I agree. That's you know, my theory on on mental illness as well. Yeah, that we need to start with them young. Yeah, before they, you know, start developing their absolutely to recognize the signs and if they do have any mm-hmm. mental health issues to realize it's okay. It's okay not to be okay yet, but you can get past it and you can get help as well. Yeah. Yeah. People don't realize exactly how resilient children really are, you know, or they forget yeah. how resilient they were when they were kids. You know, Absolutely. I mean, be, beyond the going out and riding bikes without helmets thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. When I was invited to speak in one of the first schools I went to, and the day before, it was a friend of mine who was a teacher. She said, "We've had a thought. We don't want you to talk about the rape details at all. We we don't think they should know. Just talk about the forgiveness part." And I said, "But if I don't." tell them about the rape, how will they know what I had to forgive? And then said, okay, that's fine. And I said, actually, statistically, out of these 120 kids, 
some of them already have been abused or raped or it's going on right now. You can't be so naive to think that they haven't experienced it already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's very true. You know, and, and yeah. people don't consider that. You know, they you know, you hear on, on the news, you know, this child was sexually assaulted by you know, this person or this relative or whatever and, mm-hmm. you know, they'll mention the age of the child and it's, you know, six, seven, eight nine years old yeah, and like oh my god sometimes. and younger sometimes and it's devastating and we think that's horrific to hear mm-hmm. you know but then when you actually stop and think about how many stories aren't out there about that you know that's that's the staggering scary thought you know so yeah. as difficult of a, of a subject as, as it might be to discuss um, you know we I really think we need to start bringing awareness to uh, the youth, you know, and it's, it's a, you know, very hard subject, especially on this side of the pond. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, our, you know, some of our thoughts in general with sex ed, you know, it's, you, you'd be shocked. I'll put it to you that way. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, you, you're um, unfortunately the, nothing shocks me. Mm-hmm. I'm on Twitter quite a lot, and I see the attitudes and the judgments, and you know, mm-hmm. I know what people are like. But I think it doesn't matter whatever resistance we get, we still need to speak out and we need to challenge attitudes. We can't be silenced anymore. And I, I would encourage the more mm-hmm. people that can to find their voice. And I'm yeah. hoping that collectively our voices will rise and people will start to listen. And I think people are listening now. It's, I think if we, if we keep speaking out, you know, the awareness is going to come, you know, you, I think so. you, you present it to people enough. Eventually it does seep its way in, you know, good, bad, yeah. or otherwise, you know, yeah. um, and we're 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 seeing the bad with some of the stuff that happens over here now, and mm-hmm. hopefully by us speaking out about it, you know, we're introducing some of the good. You know, um, mm-hmm. that's our goal is to is to raise awareness and you know get some get some good flowing back in the world, get some conversation going, and keeping a realistic outlook on things. So that. You know, yep. someday people are, are able to say, you know, I was raped, I was sexually assaulted. And, Absolutely. you know, you don't, you don't get the stereotypical reaction. You know, we're hoping that, like Joe said, this just the discussion causes people to, you know, forego the stereotypes and mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. listen. Because that's the most mm-hmm. difficult part. So many people are speaking just or listening just to hear what they're going to say next. Yeah. They're not actually yeah. listening to the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I and I like the thing that you said that uh, that they're doing in Iceland where they're asking the men, did she say yes? Versus absolutely. Versus the victim. That really just of, gave, uh, encouraged me. It really was amazing to yeah. see that. That's yeah. great. You know, because it because it shouldn't be well, what were you wearing, in, isn't what, it? How much did you drink? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All yeah. that stuff. You know, all the victim shaming. Yeah. You know, it's it's ridiculous. But yeah. well, unfortunately, we have reached the end of our show. We have reached the end oh, of wow. our show. <laughs> I know it went by quick, didn't it? Yeah. Um, but we are so honored to have had you on our show, Madeline. And uh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with us, um, uh, especially all the way from over there. Yeah, definitely. In the, in the middle of your afternoon on a on a Saturday yeah. <laughs> when when you could be. Doing anything. Uh, it's, it's, it's been lovely to speak to you both. Thank you for asking me on. Thank you so much. And uh, if you want to come back on the show at any time, if something new comes down the pipe for you and you want to talk about it, just shoot me a message and we'll get it worked out. I will do. Okay, that's great. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Yep. And you can pick you up uh, Madeline's book uh, anywhere. It's called Unbroken. Mm-hmm. And uh, go out and get it. And. Um, you know, have a great day. Have a great weekend, everybody. And we're going to end with uh, Trevor Page's song, Warrior. Open your eyes and tell me, is this what 
miss the mental health memoir of the year it's not your journey it's not your journey is the true story of one woman's 20-year battle with mental illness and her recovery from a suicide attempt in 2013 rebecca lombardo candidly reveals her real and raw emotions in dealing with depression bipolar disorder the loss of her mother and brother and more Pick it up today on Amazon.com or visit www.RebeccaLombardo.com for more information. Join us next week as Rebecca and Joe continue to battle the stigma of mental illness. Follow us on Twitter at Voices for Change RJ and on Facebook at Voices for Change 2.0. Hi, it's Jamie, progressive number one, number two employee. Leave a message at the... Hey, Jamie, it's me, Jamie. This is your daily pep talk. 
I know it's been rough going ever since people found out about your acapella group, Mad Harmony, but you will bounce back. I mean, you're the guy always helping people find coverage options with the Name Your Price tool. It should be you giving me the pep talk. Now get out there, hit that high note, and take Mad Harmony all the way to nationals this year! Sorry, this is pitchy. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Hi, it's Jamie, Progressive number one, number two employee. Leave a message at the... Hey, Jamie. It's me, Jamie. This is your daily pep talk. I know it's been rough going ever since people found out about your acapella group, Mad Harmony, but you will bounce back. I mean, you're the guy always helping people find coverage options with the Name Your Price tool. It should be you giving me the pep talk. Now get out there, hit that high note, and take Mad Harmony all the way to nationals this year! Sorry, this is pitchy. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law.